Sensitivity is intelligence. With grace and skill, you have abundance. Welcome to the Psychic Hour. Host Kelly Brickle is a psychic medium healer, numerologist, and teacher. Her passions are learning about the soul and energy. Whether it's through spirit, emotion, or vibrational numbers, there's always a pathway of information waiting to help. Now, here is your host of the Psychic Hour, Kelly Brickle. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Psychic Hour on WLTKDB Let's Talk Radio. And we have Mark Anthony on today as a guest. It's a wonderful day, and we're going to be diving into learning about his life, his books. He's written three books. Um, and Wow, just so many things that he's accomplished in his career. So if you are looking to learn more about how to expand on your journey and you wanted a look into someone's life that has really applied a lot of mastery in theirs, this is a place to do it. Um, we're going to be talking about all things energy. And if you want to ask a question, this is you know the fun part of our show. If you want to ask a question with our guest about their life, what we're talking about towards the middle end of the show, we start to take questions if you want to interact. So um, pop them down if you have them early or when we're talking to as well. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Angela. Hello, Jennifer. Nice to see everyone coming on in. And so the topic of the day really is going to be about faith. Um, I think it's a really interesting topic because faith is really something we can't entirely perceive. We just have to put our hearts on the line. We have to put our expectations on pause. Um, it's somewhat of an idea in our mind, granted, but really we say, hey, I'm looking to do this in my life. I would like to do this in my life. Or please, can I have help with this? There's a million things that faith can be applied to. And we have to suspend our belief of what is going to arrive around the corner because we don't know. And a beautiful thing that goes with faith, sometimes, not always, is time. Sometimes our faith can lead us right around the corner and it's just like a lightning bolt and we're like whoa okay thank you i'm so glad i trusted and other times it does take time and those are the things i find that sometimes we have to grow into those lessons because sometimes we just need help and it's just like please please i need help and that faith you know showcases itself in that moment whether let's say you have a stomach ache before an event and you're just like please i need help with the stomach ache and all of a sudden it eases right before you go on stage or all of a sudden there's like a last minute canceling and you need more than one person to get the job done and all of a sudden a person comes around the corner or uh let's say you're taking a test <laughs> you know and you need a pencil and you can't find one anywhere. It's just something like really small like that. And all of a sudden you look on the floor as you're getting from A to B and uh, you pick up the pencil on your way to like say class if you're a student, right? Cause you don't, wanna, you don't have one in your bag. It could be the little things in life that you thought about when you were a kid or when you're an adult or something ju that just happened today or this week of something that just got you through. So have a little faith. I, I think that George Michael song, right? That was playing in my head today before I went on. And the interesting thing about faith is sometimes it does need that element of time. And so let's spiral back into that. And it can feel kind of like that too, like you're spiraling in your life and you're like, I hope that this will work. I hope that this will get traction and get off the ground. And the lessons are really embedded in this time because we come to life and we do have to walk, you know, our path in a way that we grow. And in order to grow, there are these obstacles. There are these complex elements where we're supposed to scratch our head. We're supposed to rather get emotional because it brings out the understanding with how to work with our energy. It brings out the understanding with how to work with other people's energy. It brings out the understanding to work with life's energy. And if we had it so easy, we would just maneuver and just not even think about it and just keep going. But when we are stopped, when we are strained or worried, it gives us an opportunity to dig deep and it gives us an opportunity to look in places that we might not ever looked at within 
a situation or ourselves. And we go, wow, I didn't know I was capable of that. Wow. I, I never thought to look at life like that. I didn't know that was in me. And those things a lot of time take an element where we have to sit within ourselves to cultivate that. Um, also, sometimes help with the way that it arrives. It's not just an immediate help, as you know. What if the perfect person for you that you were looking to, let's say, date, marry, or that that job was just a month around the corner? That's time. That could be, be really quick to some people and that could be eons to other people. But that's an element of time where it's like, hey, just have faith. It's coming. And what about you? If you can remember the last time you had to wait for, let's say, your saving grace with a person or a situation, what about you strained and worried? Was it, if you can think about it right now, was it the, the matter of fact that your faith was hit? You're like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. I don't know if, you know, I even am excited about waking up today. There's all these just massive emotions that come forth. And within our faith, it's usually because there's an element of ourselves that believe so strongly that this is possible, so strongly that this is a possibility in our truest forms of ourselves. It's not just the things that we want. It's the things that we need. It's the things that we've put so much time and energy into. It's the things that make us come alive that we are hoping for and praying for within our faith. So I encourage you to, whether it's revisiting it with a moment today or just a passing thought now, I encourage you to put yourself the last in the place of the last time you had to struggle with your faith. And it will bring up certain things within yourself of understanding of, wow, I really had to overcome this or I had to overcome that in order to progress forward because we're all progressing forward. And sometimes we even forget to put our faith on things, right? Some of the big things, they really hit us hard and we have to, like we surrender into it. But the little things, like there could be things that really frustrate you. Like think about the things that you've been complaining about or the things that have been making you feel depressed or anxious. Have you been putting your faith on that? I know it might be too small to even consider. It might be just an annoyance. But we have all these things that we're constantly growing in and we're constantly ascending in and we're pulled in so many different directions and we find ourselves really exhausted. I know a lot of people have been really exhausted lately and really overwhelmed lately. And we have all these elements within how we're living our life where we just feel like, you know what, this is, this is feeling wonky. This is feeling weird. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm liking this year. I'm not sure I'm liking this month. I'm not sure I'm liking today. So then where is your energy headed with your goals, with your aspirations? Are they lofty? Are they small and they're just not getting traction? Where are you with your energy? And where would you like to be? Because you can go there. You can get there. And you're right. It might not just be with a snap of a finger, but you got to have faith because the places that you've been in your life where you've had the most joy, someone helped facilitate that energy, whether it's a teacher, whether it's an event, like, you know, a concert, whether it's, you know, even a book or a movie or a video game where you're just transported and you're like, I love this world. I love being in this space. Something that you were a part of where it just completely transformed your day or how you were feeling. Someone helped facilitate that energy and they, with their actuality of what they could produce with their energy said, hey, I think I'm going to go this way. I think I'd rather be here. I'd like to create this in the world. And so they did it and they really had to have faith because a lot of times the most wonderful things that we find within our life, we go, oh my gosh, thank you. I've been looking for this. I haven't found this anywhere. I haven't found anybody talking about this, speaking about this. I haven't, wow, thank you so much. And so just imagine all the faith that they had to have because they're writing a book of about something that no one else is writing about. They're doing something that no one else is doing. And they had to just trust 
that people would come or that it was the, you know, a harmonious thing within their hearts to showcase and share and that it just wouldn't be met with head scratching, right? (laughs) And so regardless of what you're feeling and doing, just go back to the times within your life where you've overcome or that you know that no matter how bad things got or how much it hurt, that things kept moving, things kept going, and your energy started changing. And yes, it didn't take away all the elements of the struggle, but it took away the elements of the confusion at certain points in your life to get from A to B. Really, a way was found, and it was, you could say, bigger than yourself, or you met the moment and you really had your held head, head, all of a sudden I have a tongue twister, head your, I, your energy up. I'm going to say it a different way. Maybe that's my obstacle today. Tongue twisters. You had held your energy up high and you moved forward. You moved forward and you met the moment in whatever way it may have been. So with that said, I'm going to put it all back to the beginning have a little faith and just let it meet you and know that you have the answer, whether it's today or whether it's a year from now or anywhere in between. Let it meet you and put your mind and put your spirit and put your heart on where you're going and just believe that the energy will meet you. And so with that said, um, with a little time now, um, in a moment, we're going to be talking with Mark and I have faith that it's going to be an awesome time. Um, See you in a few. We'll be right back. Looking for a holistic solution? Look no further than LimeStreetWellness.com. Lime Street Wellness is a full-service Reiki therapy center offering in-person and distant Reiki sessions. Additionally, Lime Street Wellness is committed to helping clients co-create healthier outcomes with hypnosis, QHHT, and intuitive advice. Lime Street Wellness is committed to helping all that are seeking to co-create better health, peace of mind, and greater freedom. Reiki master Kevin Mackey uses energy medicine, hypnosis, mindfulness, and intuitive guidance to assist in uncovering, understanding, and removing any blocks or energy cords or mental mindsets that may be intruding and causing needless suffering. Visit Lime Street Wellness today at LimeStreetWellness.com. That's LimeStreetWellness.com. back already just like that let's bring in mark and give him a warm welcome hello hi mark hey kelly thank you for having me on i really appreciate it absolutely happy to have you on i want to introduce you to everybody um so with that said mark anthony jd the psychic lawyer and explorer is a fourth generation psychic medium he communicates with spirits he is an oxford educated u.s attorney licensed to practice law this psychic explorer travels to remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena and is also featured as a speaker at conferences, expos, and universities, which include Brown, Columbia, Harvard, and Yale. Mark has appeared nationwide on TV and radio, such as CBS with the Doctors and Gaia TV's Beyond Belief. You can catch him on his live stream show where he co-hosts The Psychic and the Doc on the Transformation Network. And Mark, as well, is an author of three best-selling books, Never Letting Go, Evidence of Eternity, and his latest book that we'll be talking about today as well, The Afterlife Frequency. Welcome. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to be here. And um, I really liked what you said about faith because faith is very important and it means so many different things to so many people. Um, To me, a life without faith isn't much of a life at all because faith gives meaning and purpose to human life. That's how I've always looked at it. 
I think so too. You know, um, when we learn about our own spirituality and start to experience it, we go, wow, okay, I just can't be the only planner of my life, <laughs> right? <laughs> and even if I want things to go a certain way, um, sometimes they do, but in other cases, um, it's really bigger than me and I'm just going to trust the process. Well, I agree with that. Um, one of the reasons I wrote my latest book, The Afterlife Frequency, is because traditionally faith has been in one corner. Think of a think of a boxing ring, and in this corner we have faith, and in the other corner we have science. And ding ding, you know, and the two are, are always uh, at odds with each other and diametrically opposed. But the truth is that now that we're in the 21st century, and now that we have the benefit of quantum physics, now physicists are saying that eternal life. The existence of a soul does not violate the laws of physics. And religion, uh, some of it anyway, is getting a little bit, a little less entrenched in, uh, in the Iron Age and coming more into the, into the information age. And what we're seeing is that both of them are describing phenomena, the same phenomena through different filters and using different vernacular, but to discuss the same thing. And that's one of the reasons that I wrote The Afterlife Frequency. Um, one of the key elements that I introduce is the term the electromagnetic soul. And a lot of people, well, what is that? Well, think about since the, the dawn of, of history, every great spiritual teacher, now we're talking about faith, okay? Every great uh, leader of faith has taught us that the who and what we are in matters of faith referred to as the soul, the spirit, in matters of science and, and um, psychology, consciousness. The who and what we are pre-exists the body, comes into the body, and lives on after the body dies. And now we know from the field of neuroscience, which studies the human brain, that the brain has an electromagnetic field. We know from the second law of thermodynamics and physics, that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So to crystallize it, uh, crystallize it down, I created the term, the electromagnetic soul, to describe what we really are, which is a spirit, pure consciousness, that is eternal electromagnetic energy. And to make um, the term uh, electromagnetic soul a less technical, think of the second word, soul. That's the source of universal love. So now that we have the ability to measure brainwave frequencies, the amount of electricity flowing through the brain, and also within the last year, there have been very significant developments that at the time of death, it appears that that brainwave uh, function surges, which is really fascinating. Instead of you know coming down and, and tapering off, instead it surges, which is providing proof that the electromagnetic soul is more than a theory, that it is indeed a reality. So I think that we're living in an exciting age because science is finally getting to the point where it's proving what people of faith have believed for thousands of years. Absolutely. Um, the pieces are coming together and, um, you know, science um, has even acknowledged we're looking for something so subtle, right? And so they're in the process of trying to continue to do that with like, the, the the stuff that's upcoming, but for the electromagnetic soul, because I do love that terminology, because I think it highlights, you know, what's cased inside the body, the spirit, the electromagnetic magnetic field, the aura. It's something that is frequently interacted with, like from a psychic level, when you are um, reading people's energy, when you are receiving information. And so what has been, since you've had this understanding and you've actually are starting to teach people about what it means to have an electromagnetic soul, what has been your interaction within your life with feeling people's energy, whether it is their aura or parts of their energy coming towards you? To uh, 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 your life? I, I'm, I'm smiling because uh, this has been a lifelong a lifelong experience. And you see, 
being a medium has been part of me since day one. And both my parents, my mother and my father had these abilities and it runs in my family. I've tracked it back for, for at least four generations into the 1890s. So, you know, I'm assuming it goes further than that. It's just that, you know, trying to find uh, anything, you know, before that is, is very difficult because all the people that know that have long since passed. But, you know, my dad was a Navy SEAL and an aerospace engineer. So it's not like he was running around wearing a turban, waving Ouija boards at people. And uh, my mother was a commercial illustrator. She was an artist, you know, in addition to being mom. And so, you know, we were kind of the all American family uh, next door, kind of. Um, and, um, it was funny, every place we lived, you know, they always knew about our house, you know, and, and, and uh, we were kind of the strange, but kind of cool, strange family in the neighborhood. I always said that we were much more, um, Adam's family than we were Brady Bunch. Um, but, uh, but, but leaving all joking aside, um, part of being blessed with psychic ability is that it can make you empathic. And to answer your question, being an empath means that you pick up on feelings and emotions of people around you. And that can be a very good thing. But I remember when I first started practicing law, uh, every time I was going to the courthouse, I felt like uh, I, I didn't feel well. Um, I was irritable, I was nervous, I was afraid, I, I felt sick to my stomach. And I felt like I was getting close to having a nervous breakdown. And I remember I was talking to my mother about this. And she said, Mark, you're absorbing everybody's angst. I mean, think about it. Can you think of a place filled with more nervous people than a courthouse? <laughs> I mean, you know, most of the, yeah. <laughs> when you go to a courthouse, it usually isn't, gee, I'm having a good day. It's either, you know, you've been arrested, you're suing somebody, you know, you're trying to get a license. You know, it's, it's like there's all sorts of stuff going on there. And, and uh, yeah, very seldom do you see people that are happy at a courthouse unless they just won their case. And and even then, you know, it's, uh, there there's um, all sorts of angst involved. And so I was absorbing all this. And my mother was explaining that once you realize that, you know, it's like cut the tethers to other people symbolically and envision that you're surrounded by mirrors, which are reflecting that energy away. And once I started doing that, Kelly, then I noticed that that nervousness melted away. So for those of you who are listening, who find that, you know, uh, some people say, oh, I have social anxiety disorder. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you're very empathic. You're emotionally sensitive and you're picking up on other people's angst. And so if you envision that you're surrounded by mirrors and reflecting away all of that uh, angst, well, then maybe uh, the social anxiety disorder is also going to go by the wayside. Now, that being said, if you're on medication for social anxiety disorder, I am not telling you to stop taking your medication. Try this technique, see if it works, and then talk to your doctor about weaning you off medication. So neither Kelly nor I are telling anyone to disregard uh, let's see, the lawyer in me is coming up, but but neither Kelly nor I are telling anyone to disregard the advice of the of their healthcare professional. What we're saying to you, though, is be more aware of what the cause is of some of these types of social anxiety, and you it, you may discover that you have um, psychic or empathic gifts that haven't been focused or refined yet. And and until you get a handle on it, this is some of the these are some of the side effects. Yeah, learn about your and it's important yet yeah, to distinguish exactly, Mark, because you know health is such a fine line. Um, it's important to learn about yourself because you might just be picking up things that you've just not known you've been picking up. And when you think about it, so you know the electromagnetic soul. Think about all the the electricity in a courtroom, right? It's like a storm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, that, it, yes. It, it's like a, a storm. It's like a tornado. Um, yeah. You know, you go into a, a courtroom 
Um, there's all sorts of coercive uh, elements going on there, and there's some very high energy personalities. And then, of course, you got the judge. Um, I remember having a juvenile client uh, that went to uh, went from the judge and said it was like uh, she goes, I felt like I was Dorothy going for the Wizard of Oz with a, <laughs> ah, you know. <laughs> and, and I was laughing because it's like, oh, the way she put it, it really made sense. It, it, it's a very terrifying uh, experience for, that makes sense. for for people. Yeah, that makes sense. And you're like, you're just describing like the the, the big personalities, right? And the coercion. That's the math. Think about all the magnetism in that room. Electromagnetic beings we are. Um, but yeah, you're like being pushed and pulled in all these different directions. And you're like, why am I feeling this? Why am you know? you could hear things, you could see things. And it's, it's honestly, sometimes it is just energy. Sometimes it is just energy. So as you were growing up, you did have parents and you did have a mom that talked to you about empathy. Um, were there constant conversations growing up about, Hey, what's this? Hey, what's that? <laughs> oh yeah. You, you know, um, I remember <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because there are, there are so many stories in all of my books, never letting go evidence of eternity and the afterlife frequency. That's my latest book, the afterlife frequency. Um, I, I do talk about things throughout my life, um, but they're always used to illustrate one of the lessons that, that I'm teaching. And in all my books, they're not about me. I, they're about never letting go is a guide on the journey through grief. Evidence of eternity answers several questions people have about the existence of an afterlife, um, what happens uh, with with suicide, do animals have souls, reincarnation, and then the afterlife frequency is the scientific proof of spiritual contact and how that awareness will change your life. So I'm a character in the books, but there are um, excerpts from readings and situations that teach people that the paranormal and, and the supernatural are neither paranormal or supernatural. They're merely a normal part of nature. And once we start um, realizing this, it, it, makes, it makes life, I think, a lot easier. And also, it takes the fear out, out of the afterlife. Um, but as far as discussions, uh, when I was about five years old, I was starting first grade, and my father said, Mark, do not talk about this to anyone other than your mother and me, because people who see things that other people don't get taken away. Whoa, that really scared me. And if you'll indulge me just for a moment, um, and I remember my dad could see how afraid I was, and, and I remember he, he hugged me and he said, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to protect you. Well, I f and, and, I, and I went to Catholic school, you know, so I got there and I thought, well, they're talking about angels and saints and all these <laughs> invisible things. And and I thought that, you know, this would be cool. And then I, I, I figured out pretty quickly that, um, no, you don't talk about this there. And what had happened with my father is he had four siblings. He had a brother and three sisters. And one of his sisters was a medium like he was, as was their mother, Isabel, and their um, his maternal grandmother, Grace. So the, there were uh, four mediums in, in his family, and his sister Marjorie was married to this religious fanatic. Um, he was a Bible-thumping um, extremist, and he did not like her abilities. And this happened about 20 years before I was born. He, he, worked at a, he was a machinist, and he worked at the steel plant in Pennsylvania. And so one day, he's getting ready to go to the steel plant, and my Aunt Marjorie said she felt this terrible pain in her stomach. And it was in the area of her solar plexus. And she was doubling over in pain. And she begged him. She said, something terrible is going to happen. You cannot go to work. And they got into a big fight. And finally, he said, fine, fine, I'll stay home. Well, that day, a crane was lifting thousands of pounds of steel beams. And the cable snapped. And the beams crushed the machine shop and killed everybody in it. Well, instead of being grateful... It intensified his fear of, of Marjorie's abilities, and he conspired with an unscrupulous psychiatrist who diagnosed Marjorie as a paranoid schizophrenic, and she was forcibly removed from her home, 
put into a straitjacket and taken to a mental institution and therefore over a period of six months subjected involuntarily to electroshock therapy. And back then they did so much, you know, they used so much high amounts of electricity. It damaged Marjorie's brain so much that she never talked about spirits or seeing future events again. Now, I didn't realize this, of course, when I was five. And and I I discovered this later on. And I remember sitting down with my parents and saying, okay, what happened to Marjorie? And, and my mother was very upset about it. She liked Marjorie. And uh, my dad, um, you know, my dad was a Navy SEAL. So he was like, well, you know, uh, but I could see how, how much it hurt him. And that's why they're always afraid when I was a little boy that, you know, I'd be designated as crazy. Now, in this day and age, obviously, I mean, here you have a show, The Psychic Hour. We're talking about it. You know, I have a show every Thursday, The Psychic and the Doc. My co-host is a psychologist. We take calls from listeners and, and you know, I do readings. And the thing is, this is now out in the mainstream. I've been on national television in my capacity as, as a psychic medium. But just a few decades ago, this was taboo. This was very heavily taboo. And the sad part is, Kelly, in parts of the world, um, the Middle East, in certain countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia, and I would assume definitely Afghanistan, people who have abilities like we do are put to death. So just because we're in the 21st century, it certainly doesn't mean that these fear-based antiquated belief systems still do not wield tremendous amounts of fear over people. And that's why I like to teach that faith and science are not mutually exclusive, because when you begin to understand these phenomenon, there is a scientific explanation for everything, including matters of faith. You know, my dad was a NASA NASA engineer. And so when I was eight years old, he was my hero because dad worked with astronauts and spaceships, you know, for an eight year old. I was like, ah, you know, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one night we dad and I were looking at the stars and we were talking about the space program. And he said, there's no such thing as a mystery, Mark. There are only questions for which we do not yet have the answer. And if enough research, dedication and focus goes into anything, you're going to find an answer and it will be based on science. He said, we may not have the technology yet to figure it out, but eventually we will. And, and, and Kelly, that stuck with me my entire life. And that is one of the main motivating influences in writing the afterlife frequency was to explain not just mediumship, what you and I do communicating with spirits, but all the different forms of spirit communication, mediumship near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, people who aren't mediums who have visitations, whether it's in a dream or they feel something or they see a particular like bird or flower or whatever, and they immediately think of a, of a loved one who's passed. There is a reason all of these things happen. So it's time that all of this be pulled out of the shadows and into the light of understanding. Absolutely. So I know growing up, you had both sides to you, you know, as becoming a lawyer and having a background with having understanding about energy and more so your emotions than the average person. Um, when diving into this book, The Afterlife Frequency, and putting both together, how long did it take you to compile all that research? I know you probably had, you're familiar with some of, you know, what it takes to put together a research, <laughs> you know, portfolio paper. Uh, but how long? Because that's a lot of stuff. Like, it's the old stuff. It's the new stuff that is just coming out, too, as well. It, it um this particular book took me approximately five years to write. And the reason for that is I was doing the research plus compiling the stories because the book is filled with examples from readings. And also, you know, there was some pretty heavy duty things going on in my life at the time. Um, my father was dying of cancer 
And I, along with my siblings, we were, we were caring for him. And it, it was just for anyone who's been a caretaker and anyone who's been through that. And I know that many of you have, when you watch somebody that you love deteriorate and die an inch at a time, you know, my dad was a brilliant man. I mean, he had a first class brain. Um, he, he, he came up with so many things that were instrumental to the space program and to rocket science. You know, is he mentioned in any books? No, because he worked for big corporations and, and, um, but, but for him, um, if it weren't for him, things may, may be very different. And to see somebody that brilliant begin to lose his mind because the cancer was in it, that was absolutely horrible. And, but during all of that, things happen. And I'm not going to disclose them here because I wrote about them in the book. And so while the book took me five years, there was also a reason that it took that long because I had to undergo those experiences and apply the theories and the research that I had developed so that I could share it with the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how many case studies did you look at approximately? Oh, thousands. I mean, when I look at, I've conducted over 15,000 readings. And so you're a medium. All right. And, and in a reading and a one-on-one -on -one reading, does just one spirit come through? Not always. Most <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Usually yeah. half a dozen uh, spirits or so show up. Um, and so I, I was trying to estimate and I figure if, if I took that and about six or seven spirits per reading has come through, I mean, we're, we're adding up uh, qu quite, quite a uh, crowd of, of, of spirits. I remember yeah. in one reading I did, 24 spirits came through. It's a lot. And it was, it was. It was 21 people, two dogs and Rusty the horse. And um, it, it, it was hilarious because I remember I go, there's a horse and it's, it's got a rusty color. And she goes, oh, my God, rusty, my horse. And, <laughs> and, and, and what happened, this woman had 11 brothers and sisters. And so she had a big family. And as soon as I opened up the frequency, wham, I mean, they, they came through uh, like gangbusters. Um, I did a reading ye two days ago. And it was interesting because as soon as I opened up, I said, there's nine spirits here. And at the end of the reading... Uh, the client and I added up and it was nine spirits that communicated. So spirits uh, travel in groups. And this is part of what I call collective consciousness communication. People tend to think that spirit communication is individualized. You know, it's one spirit at a time. And they think that there's this misconception that spirits are just invisible humans with our same limitations. Absolutely not. They're pure electromagnetic energy. They move at the speed of light. Think of our electromagnetic soul as a drop of water. And when we physically die, the brain did not create your soul. It merely hosts it like a computer hard drive hosts, hosts programs. And so when we die, the EMS, like a drop of water, plunges into this eternal sea of consciousness that I call the collective consciousness. So they're interconnected with other spirits in, that are connected with other spirits, other spirits, which is why during spirit communication, let's say your grandmother, you know, Greta comes through and Greta only had a sixth grade education. But when she comes through and she's communicating, she's giving you in-depth medical information about a problem you may be going through, which far exceeds the scope of anything she knew in this world. Why? Because she is connected to the collective consciousness and they have a much, they have an infinite base of, of uh, intelligence to draw upon. So these are some of the things that I discuss in, in my lectures and in, in my book, The Afterlife Frequency, because people should not be afraid of spirit communication. It is a gift. It is a gift from God. And it's time, like I said, it's got to be taken out of the, the, the shadows of fear and into the light of understanding. Whether it's um, a spirit with a message or um, a channel or a medium like Edgar Casey, you know, he had right. 
a really limited amount of education and he was able to diagnose people and he was using words and terminology that only doctors knew about it's incredible and it's you know i know a lot of people are afraid sometimes with learning about let's say their own abilities when things get really like specific or intense but like to think about it from the place that you're saying uh it helps people you know it's it's an intelligence um if it's if it's positive it, it's a gift it really is a gift it, it it is a gift and you know people people say that well it's against the bible well it depends where you look um if you go into corinthians the first book of corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 through 12 there is a whole list of gifts from God, two of which are prophecy and the other is discernment of spirits. And it says that all these gifts are given by one in the same spirit, meaning God. And then in Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, it says that everyone is given gifts from God. If your gift is prophecy, then prophesize in accordance with your faith. And I could go on and on. I've got, you know, I, once again, these are some of the things that I write about and oh, things yeah. that, uh, that appear in my lectures. But, you know, people say mediums are not a God. Well, that's because they're yanking a line out of Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy 18. But if you keep reading that passage and get down to um, verses 21 and 22, it says that the standard of spirit communication is truth. And so if what the prophet, meaning medium, says is true, then it's the word of God. Okay, so in other words, you can say mediums are not a God, but you really need to read the entire passage. And a problem with uh, religious zealots is they take a salad bar approach to their faith. In other words, they pick and choose what they want. Um, as opposed to realizing this isn't a salad bar, it's a stew, and you have to immerse yourself in all of it and understand the entire document before you start picking a line here or there as a justification to cast the first stone. And this isn't just in Christianity, this is in Islam and, and in other religions uh, as well. Um, what's fascinating, though, is I'm not anti uh, what What's fascinating about religion is when you look at the religions, spirit communication is part of all of them, okay? And so I'm not anti-religion. What I am against is people who take a religion and twist it as a moral justification for their own ego-driven agenda. Ego, E-G-O, could also stand for edging God out. I mean, when you look at some of these things that uh, the religious extremists, it's all hate this group, don't like that, uh, hate, hate, hate. Well, I don't recall Jesus ever going around saying hate and cast out and and uh, uh, and discriminate. Jesus was all about peace, love, understanding. So was Buddha. So was Krishna. So is Gandhi. I mean, you go through all of the great spiritual teachers. It's all about peace, love, understanding, healing. But human beings are filled with anger, bigotry, hatred, and violence. And that is what faith is trying to teach us to rise above. Yeah, all these wonderful spiritual teachers. Um they are talked about to this day and written about for the tremendous beats that they accomplish. And it was in loving, um, healing capacities of grace and wisdom. And um, you mentioned, I think, Corinthians, like as one of the verse, like there's even uh, with the gifts of God, right? It's, it's, they yeah. mentioned hands on healing, you know? Hands on, yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it, it just depends on on how you view your faith and then there's people who say well um i'm not religious i'm spiritual and i always get a kick out of those people because i ask them well what do you what does that mean and very seldom do i get an answer what it means or what it should mean is when you say i'm not religious i'm spiritual what that means is you feel a direct connect to god to the collective consciousness 
you feel that connection and you don't feel it necessary to go through a particular dogma. There's a lot of people go around, well, I'm spiritual, I'm spiritual. And they can be just as, you know, evangelical as, as religious people. And so just because you say, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious, you got to realize being spiritual is being free of all that angst. And with messages from, from spirits, from, with messages from the collective consciousness, they're all about peace, love, healing, protection. They're never involving anger, bigotry, hatred, or violence. And that's how you can tell the difference between a genuine message from God, from spirits, because it's all positive. If you think you're getting a message saying, fly this plane into a building because you don't like American foreign policy, yeah, that's not from God. All right, that's coming from the human ego. I think any um, connection I've had with the other side and spirits, None of it has been, you know, coming forth with a negative message. The most negative thing I can even conceptualize, and this is not negative, this is just an experience, is just feeling the feelings that they felt while they were here with the things that they were going through, whether it was something they couldn't figure out, so they took it out on others, or let's say things like depression or the thoughts they thought, you know, that stuff can be very heavy, but it's not, that's not the message. That's like part of the evidence of knowing what their life was like. Exactly. And so, yeah. The actual things coming forth are very progressive and very helpful and people, you know, receive them. So they go, Oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, how, what, in your experience, how do you find that spirits come um, forth and um, what do they share with you? Oh, that's an entire hour show in and of Dang. itself. Um, it Dang. depends. It depends on, yeah, it depends on the reading. Um, if someone's suffering with grief, the spirits will come through the, the, the person that, that uh, um, the client, my client is grieving will come through to bring them uh, messages of love and healing and resolution. And there have been other readings where spirits have talked about world events. They've talked about the pandemic. They've talked about reincarnation. They've talked about um, technical concepts that I had to research later on, and it had to do with quantum physics. So since we're dealing with an infinite intelligence, the possibilities of what they will talk about are endless. Endless. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you find yourself um, reading people's lives to um, with their energy who are living as well? So like, you know, like a, a, trip, a typical mediumship reading is like bringing in loved ones and spirit. And then like a psychic reading sometimes is just reading somebody's life, whether where they've been or where they're going? That's not something that I, I um, hold myself out that I do. I prefer to communicate with the spirits. However, <laughs> spirits very well may bring up those things. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, yes, I can read people's auras and I can pick up things about them. And, and, um, but, but, my forte in my gift is is the spirit communication, but many times spirits will bring up like I get a lot of medical information from spirits and um, healing is a gift from God. And I've done so many readings where, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, all right, this is a condition. And the people say, no, I don't have that. And I said, well, you really need to get it checked. And then I'll get an email or a phone call saying, oh, my God, we went to the doctor and. And they said, how did you know that we should screen for this? Um, so that's that I think is is one of the most empowering and, and healing things are messages about uh, medical conditions. And so once again, I tell people, look, I'm not a doctor. So if an issue comes up, I always, I always tell people that you need to get it checked and always follow the advice of your doctor. And it was fascinating because I was uh, at a large public venue 
And this gentleman came up to me with his wife and he said, thank you for saving my life. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, a year ago, you were here and you did a reading on my wife and I was with her. And you said, the spirits told me to get my heart checked right away. And I was like, oh, I don't believe this stuff. And my wife made me go to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, dear God, you're on the verge of a major heart attack. And he said, we had no idea. Now, I can't look at somebody and go, oh, well, you look like you're going to have a heart attack. But spirits can scan your electromagnetic energy in your body and they see where there's anomalies and blockages and, and, and they transmit that information to me, which I, I share with the client. And I think that that is an amazingly um, healing gift from the other side. Absolutely. Um, do you see things that spirit gives you or hear things or like feel? How does it come in most often for you? I see, hear, smell, taste, know. Um, somebody asked me, what are the clairs? All of them. I'm yes. Claire, clairvoyant. I see. I'm clairaudient. I hear. I'm Claire Gustin. I, I smell and taste. I'm Claire Savant. I, I know. Um, so I get all of that and, um, you know, they'll, they'll come through and I'll start getting information and I'll be describing it to people. And, um, I describe how in the afterlife frequency, how to attend a, a reading with a medium, how to prepare yourself so that you get the maximum benefit out of it. Cause a lot of people sit there and say, no, 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 no to everything. And when they, I call that the no, no, no syndrome. And it's, it creates a block. You know, it's like in Star Trek and Star Wars and they raise deflector shields. You're deflecting ah. it away. Lower those shields. Instead of yeah. saying, no, 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 say, I'm not sure. Let me think about it. Or I don't know just yet. I was doing a reading for this lady and her mother spirit came through and said, uh, start talking about the seven-year-old boy connected to her. And she goes, well, I don't have any kids, but I have a seven-year-old nephew and I'm very close to him. That's my sister's son. I said, well, something about his eyes. He needs to get his eyes checked. She goes, well, that's weird because my sister said he was complaining about headaches and, and things being kind of blurry. And I said, well, you got to get him to the eye doctor. That's what your mom's spirit is telling us. And she's she's now playing me a song. Tutti Fruity, all Rudy, Tutti Fruity. And I'm singing Tutti Fruity, all Rudy by Little Richard. And, and the client said, well, that makes no sense to me at all. She goes, yeah, I know about the song. I'm not a fan of uh, Little Richard. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. I said, well, that's what I'm getting. So a month later, Kelly, I get an email from this woman and she said, Mark, this is so strange. And I'm like, OK, welcome to my world. Um, she said, I, I, I called my sister and told her this. And she said, well, let's she goes, I'm, I'm making an appointment to, uh, to the eye doctor. So the client said, so my sister, my seven year old nephew and I, we went to the to the, take him to the eye doctor, and the second we walked in the office, on the radio starts playing "Tutti Fruity, Ah Rudy" by That's Little Richard. Thing. <laughs> it's the thing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, this ties into my electromagnetic soul theory because on the quantum level, um, molecules are made of atoms, which are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which in turn are made of the smallest particle, a quantum, ergo quantum physics, which is pure electromagnetic energy. And according to Einstein's theory of relativity and other quantum physicists all the way up to the present day, on that basic level, there is no time. And, and, and so past, present, and future are all happening simultaneously. And also radio waves our electromagnetic energy. So what the mom was saying is, my grandson needs glasses, get him to the doctor, and I will tell you what song we'll be playing the second you get there so you'll know you're doing the right thing. So it's more than just, hey, isn't that cool that it happened? There is, as my dad said, a scientific explanation for everything. I really, truly believe that. And I do think sometimes it's much more logical than we um, give it credit for. Because, yeah, on one hand, we could be talking to grandma and she's like, OK, I'm mentioning this song. And then some people might think, oh, grandma's playing me the song to tell me she loves me. But it could just be validation of no grandma's coming in she's she's talking to you, but she's like giving you the heads up that that really was grandma because she's producing some of the evidence of it's just uh you know 
it's energy. It's energy. And things are not linear in the way that we communicate with grandma right now. So she's going to, you know, provide evidence with that song, but it's not necessarily because she's choosing to play it. She just knows what's coming up. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I do think that's very real. And it, that is something that really takes some fine tuning to distinguish. But I, I, yes, I a hundred percent believe in that. I think that's really cool that you talked about it. Well, I want to take, yeah, Oh, go, go ahead, ahead. ahead. No, well, I was going to say, that's also why people like Kelly and I can do readings on the phone because spirits are electromagnetic energy, which moves at the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second. In other words, that's the same speed that a phone call works that a ray of light, everything in the electromagnetic spectrum. Because people say, well, how can you do this on the phone? Because spirits are zipping back and forth at speeds that we can't even imagine. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to, no. to let, let everybody know that, because people say, well, I don't know about a phone reading. Well, they are just as accurate as in-person reading. So a lot of people want, they want to be in the same room with you all, but I'm not really scheduling in-person only because, you know, the way my schedule is. And um, also, you know, it's just safer for everybody these days. Yeah, for anyone who's really like skeptical, look into particle physics and entanglement of why this would work. So <laughs> just sh- sh- shout out, right? There it is. <laughs> There's the book. There you go. And, and I want to tell everyone, don't think that reading my book is going to be a dry technical treatise. I suffered through so many boring books in law school and the practice of law. I write my books like it's a juicy novel. OK, because you need to be educated, but it also should be entertaining, which is why um, I've been privileged to be a featured writer every month for Best Holistic Life magazine. And I invite everybody to subscribe to that. Um, if I may, if people would visit my website, which is afterlifefrequency.com, just like my book, Afterlife Frequency, I invite you to sign up for my newsletter. You can also find out about tuning into my show, The Psychic and the Doc. You can call in. I do many readings on air in tandem with my amazing co-host, Dr. Pat Basile. She's just, I just can't say enough good things about her. And you can find out about Best Holistic Life magazine and uh, about uh, scheduling a reading with me. I've got two events coming up on April 14th and April 15th. So it's in a couple of weeks and they're light circles. It's an online event limited to six people. And that way, everybody is guaranteed a connection. Everybody is guaranteed a reading. And you can find out about the light circles by going to the calendar of events on my website, which is afterlifefrequency.com. Absolutely. Yeah. There's many places to find Mark. So reach out and um, pick what you know resonates with you, whether it's his book, the classes, and uh, you have many more things coming up within the year, I'm sure, with like speaking oh, events yeah. <laughs> as well. So that's just a taste of it. So he has a lot always going on. Um, I want to take some questions too. Um, so let's see. There was one at the top. Um, someone was saying that they use the mirror technique that you mentioned um, and they wrap themselves in light. They also take two showers a day to cleanse out everyone else's energy. Um, so if they don't, they feel off, like sad, anxious, and angry, um, sometimes without that maintenance. Do you recommend anything else? Well, let me talk about the, the shower. I'm glad they brought that up. You know how in, in the Bible where Jesus washes people's feet, and you see in the Catholic Church, uh, the Pope will wash people's feet. Well, this is more than just, oh, let's clean our feet. Um the energetic field around us, you know, a light bulb, you look at the, the lights behind me and they're glowing. Okay. Um, anything that has an um, radiant energy, which includes ourselves, has an aura. Okay. And that's, that's uh, the energy field around us. And our auric field tends to bottleneck below our, our, our knees and washing of the feet. Um, it is believed opens up that channel. In other words, it gets rid of the block. And so when you take a shower, you're essentially, you're not just cleansing your body, you're cleansing your auric, you know, A-U-R-I-C, the field of your aura, the auric field. 
And think about it. Water is an excellent conductor of electromagnetic energy. So, so there's a lot to that. Um, so I definitely recommend that. I recommend everything uh, that, that, that um, uh, the listener uh, commented on. I'll talk about sometimes just take a walk in nature, you know, whether it's by a river, a pond, through the woods, because there's a complete, and, and let's lose the electronics. Take the earbuds out. Uh, nothing aggravates me more when I see people walking through the woods with earbuds in. Listen to nature. Also, the problem is um, everyone's also plugged into devices all the time that they're they're losing awareness. All and nature is very healing, particularly if you're grieving, because there's a whole different vibration, a much more calm energy there. So I recommend those that as well. Nature, nature, nature. Yeah, nature. It's just there's there's just a different level of calming the water and then I I agree also nature has all those lovely negative ions too that's a separate <laughs> consideration but it's true um since we're being all sciencey today you're making me excited <laughs> to talk about science <laughs> talk, talk away I love it uh, you know it's funny though you got to be careful in nature too all right I, I was in uh, uh, the Rocky Mountains with my manager whose name is Rocky you know of course you. Know, and, and we're taking some pictures. And so she goes, oh, look at this cave. I go, get away from the cave. She goes, and then she goes, oh. I go, we are in the mountains. And that is a cave. All right. There could be bears, mountain lions, wolves. There could be all kinds of stuff. So when you're in nature, yes, it's nice and it's calming. But um, a little common sense goes a long way. Um, like I live in Florida and you always hear about people getting attacked by alligators when they're walking along lakes. Okay, here's a very simple thing to remember in Florida. Do not walk along a lake. And I mean it, okay? Um, alligators, they have a brain the size of a pea. They react to stimuli and they will eat anything. You, your dog, whatever, okay? Um, so, so yes, nature must be respected, uh, but with respect also comes some, some reverence. Um, so when I talk about go be in nature, it's like be smart about it too. Yeah, there's a lot out there. Um, Keith mentions um, he's had a lot of family members who have dealt with cancer and heart issues. And he says, thank you for sharing this. And he's hoping um, one day to be an awesome medium. So what was your process with becoming a medium? Um, you, you don't have to mention, that's a whole show too, but like one thing that encouraged you on your path what well, was kind of being born <laughs> um, uh, with me, I, it came prepackaged. And, and um, uh, my mediumship journey, it, it would take way, way too long. Um, but there came a point in my life where it was made very clear to me that this is, I needed to be thankful for my time in the practice of law, but move on to this. So suffice it to say, it was a calling. A true calling. A, a true lot of people calling. are really resonating with the things that you are saying. So there's a lot of just like yeses and so trues out there. That's what a lot of that's coming in. Someone was talking about how one of their undergrad degrees is in physics. So fascinating. I always knew that science would explain spirituality one day. Um, and then also someone is asking if you can name your books again and where to buy them. Go to afterlifefrequency.com, and there's a section there where you can buy them. It'll give you the hyperlink through Amazon. All of my books, um, I'm not a self-published author. I have real publishers, um, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but, but what that means is my books are available at all fine bookstores. Um, they're available through Amazon. And if you go to my website, afterlifefrequency.com, um, and my books are Never Letting Go, Evidence of Eternity, and The Afterlife Frequency. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Mark has been around for a while. And, um, you know, what? speaking of, I want to ask too, what are some of the um, conferences that you have coming up later in the year? I'm going to be speaking at Spiritual Awakenings International 
um, I believe that's June 10th. And what's really great about SAI, Spiritual Awakenings International, is the conference is going to be strictly online this year. So if you go once again to my calendar of events at afterlifefrequency.com, um, go to June and you can register. And the Spiritual Awakenings International Conference is free of charge. Um, they certainly you know, could use donations, um, but if you go there, uh, that is free. And if you sign up for my newsletter, there's uh, several conferences, uh, several events that, that I'm going to be at. Um, and like last year, I spoke at the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I spoke at Helping Parents Heal. Uh, that was such an honor um, and, and so, so heart-wrenching. Um, a thousand parents who, who've been through the, the most horrific loss imaginable. And then I spoke at the Edgar Casey Center's Ancient Mysteries Conference. So um, I, I'm always on the speaking circuit. And if you sign up for my newsletter uh, at afterlifefrequency.com, uh, you'll get my newsletter. It'll keep you up to date on stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's, again, so many resources. Um, before we close the show, is there um, a piece of wisdom that you would like to share with others or just something off the top of your head that you feel is important um, to give forth? It was made very clear to me in a major spiritual experience that the reason that I'm, I'm here is to help people understand this that God exists, that heaven, the afterlife exists, that souls are immortal living spirits, that we can communicate with souls, and that we will be reunited with our loved ones in the light when it is our time to leave the material world. And that's my message. Thank you. Thank you. Um... With that said, um, we will all be re reunited in the most beautiful way. And so whether it's um, just a breath away or or many years to come, please, everybody, um, go with love, luck, light, um, and laughter, and don't forget to live. And thank you so much, Mark, for being on the show today. Check out Mark Anthony um, with everything he has to offer with his books, his workshops, and um, the classes that he promotes. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. See you next week. Absolutely, Mark. The truth is here and now on WLTKDB Talk Radio at WLTKDB.com. Thank you.